Hello, welcome to the debate on Sky News. I'm Martin Stanford. Here's our take on the things we've brought together from America, UK and around the world. Is the sky falling in on the Republican vote? Will old age decide election 2016? Iraq pleads for more help as Islamic State's advance appears relentless. There we go. That looks good. Huh? It's out there. It's out there, baby. All the tweets. <laughs> Catching up with the times or an embarrassing old man? The president goes on Twitter. In just 18 months, the polls will have opened and closed and elected the 45th US president. But which party will you choose? And, most importantly, will you still be able to vote? Or will you be just too old? Let's welcome back our regular guests. As usual, Democrat commentator Jeffrey Robinson is standing by for us in New York and the Conservative commentator Armstrong Williams is in Washington. Jeffrey, you've got plenty of voting years left, haven't you? Well, I certainly have November of uh, 2016 left, I hope. Uh, and if the Republican Party is dying off, it can't happen too soon for me. Armstrong, I guess you feel that uh, you've got plenty of voting years left in you, too. I and many others like me. Uh, listen, as you discussed, the Republican voters dying off about 2.6 million that voted will, will be dead by the time of the next election. What is neglected is about 2.2 million of the people that voted for President Obama will be dead. Also, senior citizens vote. Younger people don't vote. That has always been the remarkable difference in the elections. And so it's a, it's a catch-22 for both parties. Let's bring in the man who did the research, shall we? Dan McGraw is at Politico magazine. And, Dan, you discovered, didn't you, thought a disproportionate number of Republicans may not be able to vote come 2016. <laughs> Yeah, Martin. Uh, kind of what I was looking at here is that it's is that everyone agrees that the sort of GOP Republicans are older, and I just want to get a kind of quantify it in some way. And uh, so my take on it was I decided to look at how many people, based on actuarial tables and exit polling, are voted in 2012 and are not going to vote in 2016 um, on account of their being dead. So we found that there's a difference. So uh, Armstrong was a little wrong. Uh, it was it's uh, 2.3 million who voted for Obama in 2012 are going to be dead by 2016, and 2.75 million who voted for Romney in 2012 aren't going to be around in 2016. So it's a difference of 450,000. Uh, it's it's and it's significant. Not so much in the whole popular vote, but in some states. And that will be crucial, surely, Dan, won't it? Because the way the states go, the patterns, the states that go from one side to the other, that's likely to be in play in 2016? Well, yeah, uh, how it's working is that it's likely going to be decided by about seven swing states. Uh, Ohio, Florida, Virginia um, are three of them. And all those were close in 2012. And our story isn't saying that the Republican Party is dying, that they're doing this or that. We're saying their voters are older, therefore have a greater chance of being dead. And then the third point is these states are going to be very close. Any Either party that has a slight advantage is very important. And in this case, what we're saying is, is that if they're starting a kind of soccer match, let's say, uh, it would be before the game starts, they're behind by a goal. It doesn't mean they can't win. It's just they got a little more work they have to do. I, I think it's just another establishment rider trying to give the Democratic Party hope that the Republican Party is dying out and nothing could be further from the truth. People are going to always die. Voters, elections are about the candidates who's on the ticket. Um, the field of the Republicans are crowded. Some candidates, some wild horse can emerge. There are many things that impact the elections, even as you speak of Florida and Ohio. There have been in the past two very strong Republican um, strongholds. You have Republicans that dominate the legislation statewide. And there, there are other elements that play in this election. And obviously, depending on the candidate, uh, a lot of this has to play out. You know, he has a right to write the story um, to give the Democrats hope. But yeah, let's, let, let's run the race and see what exactly happens when it's all said and done. Uh, Jeffrey, what's your take on whether the age of the candidate 
is a real issue in any election. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking if Hillary does get the nomination, she is a, towards a senior citizen, uh, will she bring in more elderly voters? She'll certainly bring in uh, the, uh, the black vote, the Latino vote, and the, the women's vote, which matters. Uh, you know, you talk about age. Reagan, uh, when he ran in, I guess in 1980, uh, turned around and, and said to, um, to his opponent, uh, age will not be an issue in this campaign. I won't hold age against you. And I think he was, he was certainly in his 70s, the oldest candidate uh, to date. Uh, no, I don't think age is going to be an issue with the candidates. Uh, I think the candidates are going to be an issue. The first Republican debate takes place in August. They have 18 numbskulls all on one stage trying to run for president with maybe two of them uh, quasi-viable candidates and the rest uh, representing the clown car brigade. What happens in the states like Florida and Pennsylvania, which will be important, uh, and Ohio, is you have Republican legislators trying to uh, restrict the vote of young people, trying to take away the votes of poor blacks. Uh, and this is, this is disgusting. It is typical of what the Republicans do because they are so completely desperate. Uh, and when they're facing Hillary, uh, I think there's just no hope whatsoever. Hopefully there's no hope. Uh, I think she's going to uh, run away with it. Well, we'll wait and see, won't we? Dan, what's your take on whether the impact of a el more elderly candidate rather than, I don't know, a man or woman in their 40s, say, does that skew support? Does it actually help a certain demographic in the electorate? I'm not sure that it, that it makes much of a difference. And, you know, um, our story was not about what candidates run, OK? Our story was about how many voters vote, OK? I mean, uh, and... And Armstrong is saying that I was writing this to give hope for all of the Democrats. No, I was analyzing how many people voted for Obama and are going to be dead in 2016 and how many voted for Romney. Um, how they play this out, it depends on the candidate. An old candidate can appeal to all sorts of voters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But kind of what you have to realize is, is that is that the Republicans have boxed them into a corner because they're not getting a lot of the voters who are younger because of emphasis on some social issues like gay marriage, which cause problems among people under 30, okay? And they're losing ones at this other end of the scale because they're dying off. Right. So that's the problem they're facing, and there's so, lots of ways they can deal with it. So, Armstrong, what would you sure. say would be the strategy if you've got to replenish the Republican strength in numbers to try and set this score, you know, to 0-0 zero, zero before the game starts, to use our metaphor from earlier, uh, there, has the Republican machine, has the Republican candidate, has got to reach out to younger people? Uh, you know, I'm going to say something that's just going to put um, Jeffrey into a tizzy. And I love putting him <laughs> into a tizzy. So let me just get started. Uh, the Republicans have a very legitimate argument as to what we're seeing in Baltimore and Ferguson is a failure of an entitlement state and liberalism where you have these democratic strongholds. They continue to support the elite, elite businesses that go into these posh neighborhoods, but they do nothing for the inner city. I think the Republican Party has a, a tremendous opportunity to carve deeply into that so-called black vote in the upcoming election. I think President Obama's foreign policy, as naive as it is, and as good well-meaning he may be, it is a failure. You look at Iran, you look at Iraq, you look at Syria. Um, you, you look at Libya, it's just a total face. You look at Quail, you look at Israel. I think you have legitimate issues to run on as it relates to the Democratic Party and what he has produced. The economy is still sluggish. It has not improved in any way, and most Americans are not better off. If they deal with the issues, of Obamacare is a failure. If Clinton is the nominee, which I don't think she will be, they have to run to support President Obama's policies of the past, which have been a dismal failure. Yeah, but Armstrong, my question was, what gets... 20-somethings, what gets millennials to the polls at I, I, all, you know, whoever I the bring, candidate is? I, I didn't want to bring this up because I am Dr. Ben Carson's business manager for full disclosure. They just had a recent poll on who's polling best among millennials, and it happens to be Dr. Ben Carson and Hillary Clinton. So the fact that he is a candidate and a Republican shows that there's a formula that works where millennials can identify with people who are running on the GOP side. There's a formula. You just got to follow and build upon it. Dan? Well, yes. I have a daughter who's in that age group. She's in college, okay? She's, uh, and she's been in college too long, as far as I'm concerned, in, the, <laughs> in certain terms of my checkbook. But this is the deal. She's in Texas, okay? Her and her friends, because I've been keeping track of them for years, they are pro-free market. 
She just sent me a picture of her firing an AK-47. Okay, she likes uh, free market economics. They um, they like entrepreneurial things. They like the government out of their lives. When you talk about but, and here's the key but, when you talk about opposing gay, ma gay marriage, when you oppose climate change, evolution, some of these other things, they are out. Abortion. Uh, yes, they are out. It it. it if you're closing abortion clinics in the state of Texas and you're getting rid of Planned Parenthood, they are out. They aren't even going to consider listening to you. And that's a key issue here. And it goes along with they're having these older folks that are dominating the party structure in terms of policy and so forth. They're leaving, and not by their own accord, but they're not drawing in these younger voters. And part of it is these social issues. They're going to have to deal with the social issues, and the best thing they can do is to keep their mouth shut on them. Because they you know are going to drive. Let me, if I can, if I can say this, listen, I, I just happen to agree with everything that Dan just said, believe it or not. And I, well, uh, and many people hold out hope that, that the Republican Party can adjust. They should kick, kick their foot out of the mouth when it comes to these social issues. They should be more sensitive that society has changed without con compromising their values and what they believe in. But I do think that many people hold out hope that they can evolve and get the kind of message that someone like Dan's daughter can resonate with across the board. But that is a challenge, and that has to be addressed. Jeffrey? And it won't be, because any candidate who says, I'm in favor of women's rights, I'm in favor of um, uh, climate change uh, uh, legislation, goes right to the heart of the opposition to the Republican Party. They will never, ever, ever elect or nominate a candidate who will uh, side with the um, the real world on those issues. They, they don't stand a chance with social issues, and they keep bringing up these social issues like idiots. They think every time they bring it up, they're going to get a different result. And, of course, that's the definition of insanity when it doesn't happen. Dan, I know this was uh, outside your remit for this particular article, yeah. but what's your hunch about the candidates? How is it going to play out over the next year or so? Well, it's it. I'm thinking this is all elections have a kind of hold your nose quality. I think this is going to be more of a hold your nose election. Um, I don't think Hillary gets people excited about what she is going to do. It's kind of coming down to. Who's going to be, like, less bad? And so what kind of what that means, though, in terms of the turnout, these kind of hold your nose elections means you have lower turnout. You need the ones who are in your core base to come out, who voted for your party in prior elections. And in this case, because of the aging of the Republican Party, their core base is getting smaller. So a low, a, the... the uh, voters that are dying in the Republican side more so than uh, than uh, of the kind of Democratic side means in a low turnout election that that becomes um, a kind of larger sort of caveat that, that they're going to have to deal with. Dan McGraw, thank you. Jeffrey and Armstrong, thank you. Thank you, Martin. A reminder: you can see Sky News debate on Apple TV, on Roku and on Catch Up. And, of course, find us on the American website, skynews.com slash US. Now, the advance of ISIS appears relentless. Iraq's government has called for volunteers to fight against Islamic State and help retake the city of Ramadi. At the same time, the UN National Security Council said it was considering how best to support local ground forces. Well, Baroness Emma Nicholson is in the UK's government's trade envoy to Iraq. She's also chairman of Amar International Charity Foundation, which helps people whose lives have been destroyed by war and conflict in the Middle East. The situation in Ramadi is pretty depressing, if not disastrous, isn't it? The situation in Ramadi is appalling, absolutely appalling. There are hardly any words to describe the awfulness of what is going on because it is a repetition of what ISIL have done in Mosul and in the Nineveh Plain. And recently, as chairman of the Amar Foundation, I've been talking up there with some of the victims of ISIL. This is slavery, this is sexual abuse, beyond belief how any of the girls can survive. And, of course, the men are marched off and shot. And that's not happening in Ramadi. It is an unspeakable situation. We all have to get together to back the government of Iraq to wipe these dreadful people out.
Why are they being so ineffective, do you think, in looking after their own turf? This is a civil war, and what this is is the residue, and it's a rather large and horrible residue, of what Mr Saddam Hussein left behind. This is a nation, remember, that had 30 years of the most appalling tyranny, and Saddam left a big network of horrible, uh, really wicked people behind, not only in Mosul, and those are the people that, in a sense, have not been properly brought in and dealt with. But I have to tell you, they're very, very tough and unpleasant people indeed. Well, this is a this civil is war. Saddam Hussein left left behind. This is what America and the UK left behind, isn't it? We entered Iraq to rid Iraq of Saddam Hussein, one of the most cruel tyrants in modern history, just as we fought, as we now remember, with Belson liberation on us again, it just in the Second World War and the First World War, we all did exactly the same against the Nazis. But somehow Iraq is a much, much tougher place. It is in a far nastier part of the world. It's got all sorts of uh, enemies around it. And to recover Iraq as a nation state is a really long job. And ISIL is the worst bit of it at the moment. Let's bring in Jeffrey Robinson, who's in New York, and Armstrong Williams in Washington. Armstrong, this is one heck of a mess. Do you see a way out? Once the, the administration decided in 2011 that they were going to withdraw all troops and not leave at least 10,000 troops in Iraq, what do you expect? And then this little fake um, air missile strikes, it's just so ridiculous, it's so embarrassing. Uh, what do you expect to happen when, when you're when your strategy is withdrawing troops and using airstrikes. I mean, they have left these people in the most cruel situation they've ever been in. In fact, these people, whether you want to admit it or not, were far better off under Saddam Hussein's regime. This situation, I don't, we don't see any in inside. Even though the president admits through his press secretary it was a colossal mistake, this is a very embarrassing and, and a, a terrible episode in American history. And the only thing you can do, you think he's going to reestablish, re change his strategy and put American troops on the ground? The American people don't have a, a stomach for it. But the only thing that you can do, and I know Jeffrey's going to go off the chain on this, you got to hire, uh, empower special ops to go in there like mercenaries and fight those, and fight ISIS. It's the only strategy that can work. It's the only thing that they fear for those special ops to go in on the ground and fight them like mercenaries. That's the answer as far as I'm concerned. Jeffrey, this has happened on President Obama's watch, hasn't it? Well, it's happened on President Obama's watch because he inherited it from President Bush. I mean, the whole the whole idea of going into Iraq was a was a phony war based on, on, on lies and false information. But let's not refight that. I think having Emma on the program is really a, a great boon because uh, she's the real deal and, and she speaks the truth. What, what you have to look at, however, is what the Iraqis have done. Uh, the first move by the, uh, a thoroughly corrupt Iraqi government that uh, the Bush administration installed was getting rid of the full-time Iraq army. And those senior officers formed ISIL. So, you know, that's the origins of that. If you look at what happened in March in uh, Tikrit, they had regular Iraqi soldiers fighting alongside U.S. air support. And that cleared to creep. That seemed to work. What the prime minister in Iraq has done now is he's asked for volunteers, which, uh, which say that these are mainly Shiites going into a Sunni-dominated Anbar province and trying to clear out ISIL without U.S. air support. This is a recipe for utter and total disaster. Now, the other thing about ISIL that I find very worrying is our reports now coming out of the Pentagon that they're moving into Libya. Uh, it's kind of like a balloon. You know, you push the, the balloon and the air just spreads out to someplace else. Going into Libya is even more worrying than what's happening in Iraq because Libya is only one Mediterranean sea away from southern Europe. But, Emma Nicholson, how do you make the cause of the Iraqi people who are suffering in the way you describe matter to a war-weary world, and in particular, a war-weary America and a war-weary Britain? Uh, the Iraqi people badly wanted those 10,000 troops to stay. Unfortunately, the al-Sadra people wouldn't allow that to happen, and Maliki's majority was too slender to let him go it alone. But, you know, this is no way a blot on America's history. Rather, the reverse. This was a brave attempt to try to rescue some people who are under the heel of a dictator. This is not just the Genocide Convention. It is the Chemical Weapons Geneva Convention of 1925. All the red lines that are nowadays considered to be so appalling were more than breached. They were trampled right over. This is a Nazi-like 
the situation. It was a good idea to go in. What went wrong, if I could put it this way, is that the cruelty inside Iraq was not decimated, was not conquered by the invasion of Iraq and by the freedom of Iraq. And the beginning of democracy, therefore, has been very, very tough indeed. This is a harsh and unyielding environment. And it's not this Sunni Shia thing. That's much too simplistic, if I could say that. It is far more complex than this, far more than just Sunni Shia. In fact, in Iraq, Sunni and Shia were in the same families, and so were Christians, and so uh, were other uh, ethnic minorities. But today, all of that is being pushed out by the Mosul monsters who are following a very narrow branch of Islam that is coming straight out of the seventh century. Funny thing to do the seventh century with mobile telephones and tablets, isn't it? And Twitter and all the rest of it. So it's complete false pretense. But if I could ask you, what would you have the president do? What would you have the prime minister of the UK do? Because nothing is not an option, is it? Well, first of all, I'd like more troops from Britain there, but I'm not in charge of the Ministry of Defence and I can't uh, get a bigger investment in there because I think we can be very more helpful than we are. And I think both the Americans and the British and indeed anyone else who's in there can all we can do is to support the Iraqi government and the Iraqi army itself. Whether they call themselves militias, whether they call themselves uh, troops, whether they call themselves volunteers, they have to be organised to do this because this is their country, their territory and their their future. We can't walk in and try and do it again for them. And actually in Ramadi, it's got to be the Sunnis majority who do it. It's going to be horrible. Uh, man, Nicholson, can I just ask you, if we try and put the conflict to one side, which I know is, a, a, is if you like, a ridiculously big if, is the country getting back to this area where your specialist is, is, is trade? There's a lot of natural resources there, a lot of very entrepreneurial people there. If the conflict could be overcome, can Iraq rebuild itself through trade? First of all, just to jog back for a second, a very good political reason why the Allies didn't go forward to Baghdad, as I badly wished and said in Parliament we should have done in 1991, right. and that's because there wasn't a majority in Congress for that to happen. There just wasn't the votes, and at the end of the day, both of our nations are true democracies, and that's the sad thing that happened then. I wish that Congress and the British Parliament had been a bit stronger. But yes, the solution is that Iraq wants to stay together. Uh, in, in the north, the Kurdish regional government, they know now that they can't go it alone. They've had to turn immediately to America and to Iraq. On. And the same is true of the rest of the nation. So it's got to be a way in which we can assist those three parts of Iraq to come together more cleanly. But, you know, it's going to take some years to get rid of these monstrous people. The cruelty that is un being uncovered day by day. Our teams on the ground in the Amar Foundation and the businessmen on the ground as well. The cruelties that are coming out. But, you know, there's great strength in Iraq. The Iraqi people are very, very strong indeed. As chair of the Iraq Britain Business Council, I've just had a big conference in Baghdad, a huge conference of business people, and another one just a couple of weeks earlier in Erbil, planning the next one here in London in a couple of weeks' time. And business is getting on. If you can just look away from Anbar, you can see a huge amount of work with ACOM, with ExxonMobil, with Shell BP and everyone. They're going ahead with all of the work that will enable enable <laughs> Iraq to come together. So I think there is a future. I'm sure there's a future, but we certainly have to help today. Baroness Nicholson, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Next, President Obama is a record breaker. It's official. He's joined so Twitter, good. rather embarrassingly, six years after coming to office. It took less than five hours for the official Twitter account of the President of the United States to reach one million followers. That broke a Guinness World Record, formerly held by the actor Robert Downey Jr. Well, let's bring in Jeffrey Robinson in New York and Armstrong Williams in Washington. Jeffrey, how's your Twitter follower tally going? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just shy of a million by about 999,000, <laughs> something like that. But I'm getting there. Of course, he's up to... I think I just saw he's up to... 5.6 million or something like that. But that's not the embarrassing thing. I mean, I, it, terrific that he's on Twitter. And why not? The embarrassing thing is who he follows. And if you look at who he follows right away from the day one, uh, he started following all of the Chicago sports teams. But he forgot the Chicago Cubs. I mean, he's a White Sox fan. 
but he completely forgot the Chicago Cubs. You can't do that. Somebody should have said, what about the Cubbies? Armstrong, why do you think he did this just now? You know, he's a lame duck president. It's um, harmless. Uh, I know someone asked him, can they do something about his student loan? Uh, the president is not going to do direct messages to anyone. It's cool. I mean, he is within his lunch. He's got more followers in 24 hours than the prime minister Cameron has in one year. I mean, he's cool. He loves celebrities. He loves Hollywood. It makes people feel as though they're connected to him. And what he's doing, he's thinking about his legacy as president of the United States. And what way to endear yourself by people thinking you're real cool by having your own, having your own Twitter account. Twitter is not cool, is it? I mean, in terms of sheer... I mean, it's so last year, or is, is it the year before? And there was Facebook before that. I mean, if anything, he should be on Snapchat, shouldn't he? The president is using whatever works best for him. You know, there was detailed research and thorough thought that went into this because he had other handle, handles before that he used that he really did not really respond to. And this is the first where he said he would have directly Twitter. I'm sure if the president is in the bathroom... If he's waiting in line, waiting to walk into a building, he can put out his phone and Twitter. Isn't this cool? Standing here with my wife. We're getting ready to do such and such. It's just tame, cool stuff. And you know what? That's the mind of most Americans, that of a seventh grader. That's the kind of stuff that the president would be tweeting. They'll understand. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, the next thing, of course, is Periscope, because uh, every Twitter user now is being encouraged to get their Periscope camera out. And, uh, you know, it's normally something pretty pedestrian, isn't it, about uh, some dull aspect of their life they suddenly want us to share with. Do you think he's going to be showing us around the West Wing or something? Well, he does. He, he does selfies. There are some wonderful selfies that he's done and have, been, and have shown up on Twitter. But the best response to Barack's Twitter account came from Michelle, who tweeted him, it's about time. Indeed so. Jeffrey Armstrong, great to see you. Thanks for being with us today. Hashtag that's it for now. And that really is it for now. Don't forget, the debate can be seen on Sky News, on Apple TV, on Roku and on Catch Up. And of course, at skynews.com slash US. Until next time, goodbye.